All right. Uh, Good morning. Waiting for the video. Yes. <laughs> I think we are officially live here. Good morning, everyone. If we are, in fact, officially live. I believe we are. I, we are live. Welcome, everyone, to this uh, Saturday morning uh, in uh, late November. Um, it's a beautiful day out here, at least in uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and I hope from wherever you're calling in that uh, it is a lovely Saturday morning for you as well. We are excited today um, to talk, to learn, to collect um, uh, on a wide variety of, of, of things. So really looking forward to a great day of Yardversity. Uh, we'll get more into, again, what that project is how you can start collecting data. Um, and again, our theme this month is wildlife cameras. And we're going to explore the use of wildlife cameras with, uh, within the state and at the Urban Ecology Center. And we're gonna talk about some um, art and how you can find some art connections in nature, whether that's through uh, photos you take, through wildlife cameras, or even in your backyard. Um, so please stay tuned through the whole time. And then, of course, as always, we will end with trivia meant for all ages, including, yes, all ages from kids to adults. <laughs> I'd like to give a special shout out to the folks that are joining us and on the chat. We, we'd love to hear from you on the chat. So good morning to Soren and Jen and Al and uh, anybody else. Feel free to, to say who you are and uh, where you're uh, joining from. And uh, we're excited to hang out for a little while. The Yardversity Project is kind of, uh, again, looking at the biodiversity in our backyards. And we're doing this every month um, to track the phenology changes, the things that are changing in, the in, in our environment based on the weather, the time of year, and things like that. And while you may think there's not too much happening in November, there is indeed things are changing, animals are moving, plants are senescing, um, and things are happening. Um, at our Washington Park branch, we had our, uh, the ice, we had our first thin layer of ice. That is a phenology change, as something to track and to keep note of when you have the first ice over in a pond, a lake, or a river. Ethan, did you uh, say the plants are senescing? Yeah, is that, is that the correct use of that? I think it is. I just, I'm not used to hearing it, so. <laughs> it is early, too. I guess they, they have snest for the most part. I shouldn't say Oh, that's, that. a, that's a, a very appropriate word. I just, I love to hear it. <laughs> um, and then we have uh, uh, the, the, the male deer, white-tailed deer, the, the bucks are going into their rut right now. Um, and so you have these changes within the animals that the dark-eyed juncos for the birds are, are back. Um, you have, we've had tundra swans and sandhill cranes flying over Milwaukee. Uh, so you really have some big changes going on um, in the plant and animal world. Um, I am going to go through a uh, tutorial on how to use iNaturalist because um, we will be collecting data um, in our backyards. And that means you'll be taking a photo uh, with your camera um, and then submitting it onto the free app, iNaturalist, to be used in our collective database. Um, and then also that data can be used around the world. So iNaturalist is a photo-based observation app. And so um, either you can use a camera or a smartphone that has a camera with it. Um, and that will help you um, uh, submit uh, documentation uh, to the project. So again, Yardversity uh, uh, is, is a project where we're collecting um, data from our backyards on any living um, organism, plant, animal, snail, uh, spider, things like that in our backyards. Um, because backyards are truly um, incredible and there's so much collective land in backyards and we want to understand um, uh, what, uh, what is in people's backyards and what that means for research, for the environment, 
um, for, the, for conservation in general. Uh, is there anything else that you all want to say before I launch into a, a, a naturalist tutorial? Yeah, maybe we could do quick introductions and then just a, a, a brief timeline of um, if people are looking forward to certain parts of today. Um, so I guess first, um, we'd like to introduce uh, a student from MSOE who's going to be leading our art reflection today, Veronica. Um, and that will start at 9.30. So um, we'll be collecting data from pretty much whenever Ethan's done like 9.15ish through the iNaturalist tutorial um, through 10 o'clock. And then we'll begin trivia at 10 o'clock until 10.30. Um, and then, yeah, we'll all be chatting um, basically in this hour. So who are you? Yeah. <laughs> I'm Veronica. <clears throat> I'm a user experience student at MSOE. And I consider myself as an artist and I love nature and people. So looking forward today to collaborating together, working on nature and art and how we can bring it all together. Okay. And we're super excited to have Veronica and, um, and super excited that all of you are joining us. And I'm Tim. I'm part of the research department at the Urban Ecology Center. Likewise, I am, uh, I am Ethan Botten. I'm part of the research team at the Urban Ecology Center. And I'm Maggie Steinhauer, also UEC. Cool. Well, we are so excited to get going. And if you already know how to use iNaturalist and you've really been doing this, feel free to head outside right now to your back porch to whatever you consider your yard and start collecting uh, data. Um, but for those of the, you that need a refresher or, or learning how to submit data, um, please follow along for the next 10 to 15 minutes. All right, so the first thing you're going to do is you're going to go ahead and download iNaturalist in the Google, um, either the Google Play Store for Android or the App Store for uh, uh, Apple. Um, it's going to ask you to kind of create an account once you download the app and you go into iNaturalist. I'll show you what that looks like. I'm going to share my iPad screen here. The iNaturalist app looks like this one in the top right in my ID folder. Uh, my own personal profile, it's going to look a little different for you. And it'll probably be blank here in the observation field where you see I have 184 observations. Looks like my internet is stable. Hopefully um, I'm sticking with you all. You're freezing up a little bit, but we think we got the gist. Okay. Um, uh, the first thing I'm going to have you do is actually join the Yardversity project. So in the bottom right hand corner, you're going to see a briefcase where it says projects. You're going to go ahead and click on there. Uh, and you can see I'm a part of quite a few projects here. Um, you're going to have none of them in there if you have not yet joined the project. And what you're going to do is you're going to scroll down or you're going to click that in the top right hand corner, the magnifying glass. And you're going to type in yard and then ver -t. And at that point, you should see this uh, beautiful yellowish logo that says Yardversity, and that is the project. Underneath the word Yardversity, you're going to see leave, news, and about. It's leave for me because I have uh, joined the project. But if you have not yet joined the project, it will uh, there will be a join option there. So go ahead and click join. At that point, you are now part of the official Yardversity project, and you can start adding observations to this project so we can keep track of data specifically from people's yards. Um, iNaturalist is a great app to take photos of all living things from wherever you, wherever you are at whatever time of day. Um, but for Yardversity, we only want data from your yard to be included um, into this uh, this project. All right, now that you are part of it, you can kind of go back with that top left-hand uh, section. It will look a little different if you are on, a, uh, are on an Android. There will be a couple other uh, different options and stuff like that, but I can work through it with you um, after this if you have questions. All right, I am now a part of Yardversity, and now I'm ready to add my first observation to the project. You're going to go down to the bottom middle where you see the camera button. 
or the observe, and you're gonna go ahead and click on that. Um, uh, you have two options when you go outside. You can either just take a bunch of photos to your phone, um, uh, but straight up to your camera roll. Um, and if you do that, then when you come back to iNaturalist, you would then select, select camera roll, and then you'll uh, include your photos based off of when you took them. Oh, if you want to upload your observation live, you're going to go to camera. And it's going to pull up your camera. And because I'm inside on my computer, you see my lovely keyboard. And you could take a photo. I'm going to pretend that I took a photo of something else. So I'm going to go to my camera roll. And I'm going to pretend I took a photo of this muck. I'm going to click done in the bottom right. And I'm going to click next. So pretend you just took a photo of a plant or any other living Thing in your backyard, and you're going to click next. Um, uh, so now you see your photo up in the top left where it says default, and um, hopefully you get a clear close-up photo of that living organism. Uh, the blurry, blurrier it is, or the less detail you can provide, the harder it will be for people, the community, and for the artif artificial intelligence to identify. So we're gonna use the AI here to help us identify this species. You're gonna click on that question mark. What did you see? <clears throat> it's gonna load for a second. Um, and it's gonna give me, um, uh, it's pretty sure it's in this genus. You can select that, but it also thinks uh, it can get it down to the species level, which is much, which is more specific than the genus level. Usually that top option at the very top is what it thinks it is. So I will select a white underwing here. If you want more information, look at more photos of it, you can click on the um, I, the uh, question, or like the information uh, button to the right. Um, and don't be worried about submitting the wrong observation. Like you may not be an expert on moths. I'm not either. Um, but it's okay if you submit the wrong observation as iNaturalist is a community um, where how I identify it. So if you have a wrong observation, there, is so, there are many moth experts out there who will then be able to correct your identification. Um, and so uh, please don't worry about getting the wrong um, uh, identification. So I'm gonna go ahead and select white underwing there. And now you will see it says white underwing there. Because I took this photo on the iPad or your phone, it keeps some of that what we call metadata, data about data, and it has the date and the time and the place of where I took it. Um, uh, the next thing you're gonna do is you're gonna kind of skip all that information. If it wasn't already pre-populated with that date and time and location, go ahead and select those buttons. Um, and uh, so this was taken in Milwaukee, but I took it somewhere else. Um, you can kind of, it'll show you the map and you can move the crosshairs to where you actually took the photo. So we'll say I took it right over here. You can save that. Uh, if you're concerned, if this is, if you're concerned about your privacy, um, you can go to um, obscured or private um, and that will, um, uh, kind of obscure your observation from the general public. However, it, we will be allowed to um, see that uh, having location data is vital to um, data. And so from a research end, uh, the people of the project will be able to see the exact location, um, but the general public will not be able to see that. Um, I tend to use open, but I know I have other friends and um, colleagues that like um, going to obscure or private if it is in their backyard. All right, the last thing you need to do now is go to projects in the bottom where you see that suitcase. And you'll see all the projects you've joined. Um, hopefully, if you're just new to this, you will only have one to choose from. And that will be Yardversity with that yellowish uh, logo. And you're gonna move that green icon. I know in Android, it's a little different I forget if it's a button or on off or something or join in out, um, but basically it should now be selected as you can see. I can then click on the back arrow 
And you will see now projects it has a one, which means I am joined to that project. And you'll go to the bottom and you're gonna click share and you're gonna wait uh, go to me. And you'll see now uh, that it is syncing and uploading my photo. So this is the way you do it using a phone. Uh, I have tutorials on how to use uh, iNaturalist, uh, extens a more extensive tutorial online in our UEC in my backyard uh, page. Um, but this is the brief tutorial. You can uh, submit things online on the web. Um, so if you have an SD card with the camera, you can upload photos uh, via your computer as well. So that is your briefest uh, tutorial on how to use iNaturalist uh, for the project. Uh, please let us know in the chat if you have any questions um, at all about how to use that or if you're confused about something. And if you're hearing for this uh, about this for the first time, or if you haven't yet used it, uh, I do just want to say it is it is quite addicting. And I remember one time I was I had like two bags of recycling to take out, and I took out the first one, and then I spent probably 45 minutes i naturalisting or yard versiting my backyard because I saw a really cool uh, wasp on one of the on one of the flowers, and I took a picture and and was watching it. And uh, then I found another really cool insect and another cool insect. And then the, so the really cool thing about this is you're collecting data that's important for the project and you're finding out who's using your backyard. And then, and then you start to put the names on the species and then you can look up the species and see like all the cool natural history about them. Um, and one of our, uh, one of our uh, best yard versity users, Jen Lazuski, uh, is uh, was was talking about the value of of just knowing the the natural history of the creatures that are in your backyard, and that's why we that's what we've been focusing on, particularly since the stay at home orders. But uh, this really is a cool project for learning about. Again, if you and if you don't have a backyard, if if uh, you know you've got an outdoor patio, or if you have green space around your wherever you're staying. It's just a really fun way, and I encourage you to to look into it a little bit more. And maybe some of you are out doing that right now. Uh, so just wanted to go ahead, Ethan. I want to share. I'm sharing my screen right now of the iNaturalist Project Yardversity page. And I, just to, if you go or even on your phone and you search the project, you can see some of the data that we have collected. And you can follow us real time today as we collect data in our backyards. You can see the number of observations we've had, the number of species, the number of people who have helped identify it, and the number of observers like you, community scientists, who have submitted uh, data specifically to this project. Um, so go ahead and scroll through, see some of these wonderful photos. Can you go to the map, Ethan? Yes, I can. Let's go here. This is just this a reminder kind of, that, oh, go ahead. Yeah, this is a representation of where the data has come in so far for this project. Uh, we have Minnesota, Wisconsin, Ohio, uh, Maine, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, uh, Colorado. Oh, wow. uh, is so it's just a reminder that so. no matter where, wherever you are, uh, and if you consider something a backyard, you, you can add to this project. So you wouldn't do it in like a public park um, or, you know, maybe a private forest or, but if, if, if the area that you're in is, is what you consider backyard, take a picture and send it in. It, it can be anywhere. It can be, um, you know, even if you're right in the middle of the city and there's just a tiny little patch of green space outside your, your building, uh, that's a backyard and, and it's important data for this project. Mm -hmm. I think it is fun to, even though now, as everything is senescing, um, it's, it's still fun to take pictures of things as they are dying to see, maybe work on your ID um, throughout, like how, how a plant will change over the seasons. Um, so there is still a lot to see, even though we're not seeing the insects and the, all, of, all of those things like we do in the summer. Um, but it's still exciting to see kind of the secrets of your yard. All year round. 
are running a little behind schedule, so I'm going to uh, move right into our uh, wildlife camera uh, discussion, kind of to talk about why we use wildlife cameras, um, how we use them at the Urban Ecology Center, what we've captured, and kind of talk uh, additionally kind of about what has been seen in the state. Uh, there was a great presentation by uh, the Snapshot Wisconsin team yesterday that talked about this awesome program um, uh, where uh, landowners can put a wildlife camera on their yard um, or in their private property um, and then share that data with the DNR and they have been able to model distribution of deer, estimate populations um, because they've been able to canvas these ca cameras all over the state um, and it's incredible. So I'll get into that later. later. But, uh, but okay, so let's start talking about wildlife cameras. Um, so you may be wondering what a wildlife camera looks like. Um, this is uh, an example of a wildlife camera here. You can see the infrared technology that kind of this is the camera where the, uh, um, actually I don't know if the camera comes out of here or here, um, but um, I think this is actually the sensor here, uh, the infrared technology to sense uh, movement. Um, and then um, you have within it, you have a place for, um, changing settings and the camera. So that's kind of what a wildlife camera is. You strap it to a tree near a wildlife trail or pointing to an interesting a spot that you think there's animal activity there. Um, and we've been having wildlife cameras up in, in the parks at the Urban Ecology Center since uh, 2008, I think, Tim, if that's right. So we've been collecting data for, for uh, um, many, many years at the Urban Ecology Center at our three branches. And uh, let me look at some of our, our, our stats. Um, actually, I have, yeah, from 2011, we have data that says um, from some of our cameras that raccoons and squirrels were our most common frequently uh, documented uh, species. But of course we have uh, deer, cats, dogs, humans, uh, coyotes, um, and things like that. I will um, say we actually put up, bef I've been working at the Urban Ecology Center, Center since 2002. And, um, you know, I started at 18, if you're doing the math. And uh, yeah, we, they actually had already put, they, they already had cameras up uh, in, in the year 2001. And the the main difference was that to get the data you had to open the camera and take out a roll of this thing called film and take it to walgreens and they would develop it for you and then you'd actually get pictures back to see what your wildlife was so instead of just scrolling through digitally you had like you know a lot of them are blank you'd go through a lot of blank pictures and oh there's a blurry chipmunk in there so we've actually been doing this for about 20 years but it wasn't until okay whatever, you know, 2008 that we started doing it digitally and have it all stored. It's amazing now with the technology that the, the, they use artificial intelligence to go through wildlife cameras because it takes a lot of human time to go through and identify them. Um, but uh, so that's part of the snapshot Wisconsin where they use the community to help identify them and you can volunteer and help identify um, things of that nature. Um, so uh, I thought it'd be cool to kind of share some of the photos that we've captured at the Urban Ecology Center. Um, let me get there. Um, let me share my screen here. Let me sure I share the right one. There we go. Uh, so this is from a recent camera, a very recent camera that we just uh, collected the data from. It was up for about, uh, what, one month maybe in a Riverside Park location? Around a month, yeah, just under. About a month. And uh, this is a urban park in uh, Milwaukee. And you can kind of see some of the data just by reading. We've had 462 observations of, of deer. Um, I, I do want to note that when a deer walks by, it takes a flash of three photos. So kind of subtract, uh, divide everything by three. And that's kind of um, maybe a better estimate of what we've seen. But uh, I just want to go through some of the deer photos. Oops, got to log in. Oh, I'm timed out. 
Uh, let's see. Keep trying to log in. There we go. All right. Sorry about that. Uh, really quickly, Al just asked if there's a if they if you recommend a, a particular camera for backyard and and the folks at Snapshot Wisconsin use Bushnell models and and those are are fairly uh, cheap and and good. But they also mentioned there's something called a, a, a brand called Reconyx, which is like the really really high end. Um, so I put that in the chat too. Wonderful. Bushnell too at the UEC and I haven't used any of any other camera before, but I do really like the Bushnells. And they have, it they have, on they have a wide variety too of options of camera um, within their brand. It does depend kind of on what your goal is, the wildlife camera. It can vary if you're a hunter kind of tracking deer, if you're wanting a really quality photo to share with friends or family, or if you're doing it for a research purpose like we are. And depending on each goal, you're gonna change the settings accordingly. Um, depending on the quality of the picture, how many photos you want, the sensitivity of the sensor, and things of that nature. But overall, Bushnell is the best value brand to get you started. Um, and uh, you can't, yeah, you can't really go wrong with many of their models, um, some of their popular models, and you can see some of the favorites um, online. Um, so I, I want to get into some of the really cool photos that we recently had. Um, and this is a, uh, a beautiful um, image of one of a young buck. Um, and so we track um, that information that indicates that it's a male and you'll see it here, it says deer adult antlered. And so we have the date and the time that it was seen at. So this was uh, pretty much at night, it was dark out um, during that time. Um, so this is just amazing, here's, it, was this the, the best photo Maggie of the one with the, uh, the antlers with a, of a nice buck. This is happening right here in Riverside Park. And it's super amazing that we have antler deer. Uh, we have bucks. They're going to their rut right now here in uh, Milwaukee, which is just really crazy to think of because you think that all happens out kind of where everyone goes deer hunting. Uh, we have, uh, I think, a woodchuck. I think, I don't know if it was the best shot of an image of it. I don't um, know if it's confirmed yet. But, uh, but that was okay. Well, that's why the community is amazing to confirm whether the woodchuck or not. We have cottontail rabbits down here. And as uh, the DNR said yesterday, we have the snowshoe hares kind of in the northern part of the state. Um, let's look at any last um, photos. Um, there's a nice possum kind of moving through this corridor through this hole in the fence. Um, animals are traveling along the fence because they can't get through. And then there's a hole, which creates a perfect um, place for them to uh, walk through. Okay, I'm gonna quickly share some, uh, the Snapshot Wisconsin uh, data dashboard place, where you can kind of look at some statewide data and see how, kind of how it relates to the Urban Ecology Center in Milwaukee. So you can see that the black bear has been seen only in the northern part of the state. And in the southern half, we have not had any observations of it at all. That is true for us. Um, the cottontail is pretty cool to look at. We have the cottontail uh, plenty here. And you can kind of tell that it's much more common in the southern half of the state. And it gets uh, less prevalent as you go north. It's still seen up north, but just less frequently. Um, I'm sure the snowshoe hair will be um, you will see really see that uh, disparity between the northern half of the state and the southern half. And that's one of the phenology changes, even though it's not happening in Milwaukee, but the snowshoe hare is changing white around this time in that northern part of the state as there is snow, um, it, I believe, I'm pretty sure there is uh, an inch or two up north uh, at this time. And then it's really cool with Snapshot and we're a part of this program. Uh, they collect all that time um, that spatial time of when it detected it. And you can see the pattern that really when these animals are the most active. Um, and so for deer, uh, we know they're active in the morning and evening. And yes, look at this. We have uh, over 100,000 observations around 6 a.m. and around 6 p.m. And we have this um, uh, pattern, this lovely pattern that we can see. Um, so 
that's about it. I'll share a couple links to if you're interested in specific um, trail cameras for your own interest, I'll share a good link to kind of do your own research. Um, again, it depends on your wants and needs and goals. Uh, so I'll go ahead and share that in the YouTube chat. But with that, I think um, if there aren't any other questions, are there any questions in the YouTube chat? I haven't been keeping track. Yeah, that's that's the only one we got so okay. far. So, cool. Oh wait, um, we have a we have a comment to give people an idea of pricing. We have a Bushnell DS Low Glow. This is from Robert Burnham. Uh, Two hundred dollars at Cabela's, and mentioned that's about a medium price. Yeah, that's I think about the like mid range price you're gonna find between 150 to 200 will be that mid range. Um, you can get cameras under hundred dollars. I don't know how great they are. Um, uh, but that Bushnell low glow, uh, I, those are, they have great options across that low go, glow spectrum. You can go to no glow, which means there won't be, there won't be a light produced. Um, but again, it depends on your like your purpose, what you're looking for. You'll get a better image with a low glow, um, but it could potentially scare or um, tell the wildlife that a camera is there. Um, so I, I'll include I'll I'll include a link or uh, to the brand that we have currently. Um, technology is always changing, but I'll include something that we at the Urban Ecology Center really like. Um, and um, again, that's for research purposes, so it may not be the best for personal um, preferences uh, at your home, but I'll still include that information. All right. A quick update oh. on, our, on our data coming in um, on INAPTOS. Mm -hmm. We have a few, um, we have a, a ruby-throated hummingbird and an American robin, both from earlier in the season. Um, ah. It's a really nice picture of this robin. Um, but that's another good thing about iNaturalist too, is you can retroactively upgrade pictures that maybe you took in June. Um, as long as that date is attached to that photo, it'll it'll count in the project. And somebody named Ethan Absolutely. Bott submitted a white underwing from, I wonder when that was from. I will have to delete that observation in a little bit. And <laughs> um, I really have submitted it. All right, let's move on into a discussion about art, nature, kind of another side of um, our connection with nature that uh, we haven't talked that much about here at the Urban Ecology Center. And we're really excited to have um, Veronica here kind of um, guide us through a discussion, kind of open up some thoughts, um, talk about an activity um, where you can all participate in. Um, and so we're really looking forward to having uh, Veronica here kind of talking about some of those things. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna uh, hand it over to Veronica and uh, we'll go from there. Thanks Ethan for that kickoff. Um, so yeah, today um, the purpose of this discussion is and like using art as a tool kind of like to slow down and like think about what you're learning and just like reflect upon it how you feel and what you can learn from it. So I actually attended the university lecture yesterday on the hidden cameras presented by Snapshot Wisconsin. So I'm gonna first share what I created, like an art kind of like snapshot of like what I learned and how I reflected upon it, just to give you guys an idea of what you could do or like what it could look like. So I'll share my screen real quick. Um, so you can see here, I have a little hidden camera um, I don't know, like a trail camera, I guess you could call it. And then a magnifying glass, uh, kind of around the camera. I used the magnifying glass because it symbolized like a, a closer look into nature because like these hidden cameras can help us see like into the wild that we normally sometimes can't. And as I, I was, as I was telling Maggie and Tim Ethan yesterday, I decided to draw a moose because I will travel to Sweden about every year in summer. And if I'm lucky on a special occasion, I will actually get to physically see moose because um, my grandparents live on a farm. We have a forest, we have prairie kind of laying around and then I get to see a moose oftentimes. Um, but it's a very special occasion really. So 
I think moose are fascinating. They're really cool creatures. Um, so I was, it'd be really cool if we could place hidden camera into the forest and like see them, like what their lives look like. Um, and a, a magnifying glass can also symbolize a scientific aspect because you're collecting data um, through the hidden cameras. And then I also wrote a poem here. So I'll uh, read it for you guys. Uh, it says, in my home tucked in the city of Milwaukee, I can't help but wonder of the wildlife around me. I am curious to find what I can see. Hidden cameras are a gift to all, a glimpse of the hidden life, showing how the animals live, even in fall. Even though I cannot be present out there, I can still see and hear nature call. So um, I've been reading uh, Braiding Sweetgrass and one of the things they've been teaching you, she's been teaching you is like, what are like the gift of nature and what I see of the gift of these hidden cameras is although I may not be able to be outdoors, especially with quarantine and the lockdown, but these cameras can help me see like snapshots into the wild, into the outdoors, to nature and see the life that's happening out there. And so now I'll ask Maggie and Tim and Ethan here, but this is a question for you all watching too. It's like, what could you learn from the hidden cameras? Like what's a gift that you see that the cameras are giving to you? Well, the first thing that comes to my mind, um, I just think it's so fascinating getting to see whether whether you're looking at wildlife that avoids humans, um, so they're hidden uh, when you're out and about, or whether they are nocturnal or crepuscular, as it looks like we like that word, um, and we just don't normally see them on a day-to-day -day basis. I think um, kind of getting that glimpse into their lives when all we ever really know is just kind of what we read or what we hear and we never, we all have it in our imaginations of what that's like, but to actually see it um, on photos is really cool. And you can piece together behavior, um, different patterns. Sometimes you'll have families or groups of animals or um, sometimes you'll get a domestic cat on a tree or something and it'll it's almost like they know the camera's there and they'll they'll show their personality through their their photos and their behavior. Um, while we were doing the first segment I did a really really brief little sketch and it's pretty bad and I don't know if I feel super confident sharing it, but I, but I will anyway. Um, I don't know if my, Here. yeah, I don't think my, there we go. And it, um, I'll make another comment too, that sometimes I guess a lot of people have this intimidation that they have to create something beautiful in art, but sometimes it's all about the experience. It's just like, I'm going to create something. I want to learn about it. I want to learn about myself and I want to put it on page. Yes. And it feels so good once you actually... Sometimes it's hard to make the move to put pen or pencil to paper, but then once you get started, it just feels so good. Mm -hmm. um, and this is, I don't even know if the camera is going to be able to show it, but I just showed my current situation where I am in my chair with my binoculars. It's not so much a, a trail camera, but it's essentially looking through a lens um, into my backyard. I don't have deer, but <laughs> maybe I don't know. Maybe I do have deer and I just don't know it because I don't know what their lives are like. But I wanted to show kind of how we're kind of hidden on both ends. So like they're going about their lives, they're hidden to me, but also they don't know that I'm necessarily behind this wall looking through this window at them as well. So it's kind of, it works both ways. Um, and I just, I don't know. I think there's something so special about learning the nuances of wildlife. Okay, I just just now sketched something that uh, is probably going to seem a little bit more like a logo or something. Mathematical. Um, <laughs> but but the, so, so there's a wave. And then oftentimes with 
with cameras, uh, a lot of these cameras are used in, um, in, in for, for hunting, deer hunting, and so sometimes you'll see like a target. And so what I'm really seeing is, is, is uh, the way the cameras work is that infrared waves are detected by the camera. And, but there's also an image that needs to be transmitted and the images that we see in, in light and heat are both electromagnetic radiation. They're the same thing. We just, our bodies sense them differently. And so, uh, so light, light is kind of like this. We think we know how the universe works because like Einstein did, you know, the theory of general relativity. But then we realized with uh, quantum mechanics that the, there's maybe a different way to explain things. And light kind of bridges those two because it's a photon and a wave. And, um, and so that's why everything's kind of coming together in that center. And, and so the, the image has to travel through air to the camera. And then we've designed the camera based on how we see the world. And we see the world, we only see, you know, a very small sliver of that. And then, so we've designed the camera to do this, but, but wildlife sees it in such you know, different ways. Wildlife can detect other parts of the spectrum, ultraviolet and, and, and other colors. So, so I, 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 I'm gonna noodle on this little sketch, but I just, what I love about the work that Veronica does and, and uh, you know, and particularly she mentioned Robin Wall Kimmerer is that we think of science in this, in this kind of narrow intellectual, like here are facts and formulas and, um, when you when you bring that artistic and you open up your mind and allow for f to explore these other parts of your brains that scientific scientists don't typically do i guess uh it really broadens the way you can see the world and think about the world and there's filters between what i'm saying and what i'm thinking too right so like there's so many interpretations uh and so it, when we first put this together how are we gonna you know how this seems like a kind of a weird marriage of wildlife cameras and art but like it, it just it's it's makes so much sense um when you kind of look at it in this way so another thing too is art is like you create your experience into form and i think what's amazing about art is you want to share it and i think that's what makes us human you have your own personal gifts and you share it with the world and you know considerably the what the cameras take photos of. I think that's art too in a way because you can share that with other people. And I think that's what brings a lot of joy into people's life when you have the opportunity to connect and share with other people. And Tim, do you think you gotta hold that up again for me? Your drawing? Uh, let's see, I don't know. Yeah, well, I well, thought well, it was really cool. Let me spotlight him here, here we go. Okay. So I it, like, I literally just did this about four seconds but I'm, I'm gonna expand upon this so like, so you have your like target in the middle and then you have, that's also a photon, a point, and then you have your, uh, your light wave, but then you have the dimensions in which this can all be explained. Mm -hmm. So like, I think it's really cool how uh, like different approaches we had. Uh, Tim, when I first saw that, I kind of like thought about how like, um, like we'll take deers for example, like they're living their life on that line. And like you were saying, like the, the proton or the photon, and that center moment you get to like that's like the I guess the camera lens and that's like the moment you get to see in their lives and when they're captured so that's what I thought initially oh, I love that when you shared that so that's great yeah Ethan how's it going over there have you made any sketches yeah, I had some I, I had some other thoughts I, I haven't sketched anything but um I thought of like other ways that you can like perceive art like in nature like I, I think of like maybe like a fly fishing of like you need to think so intimately of the the other side of the the fish on the other end or putting up a wildlife camera you need to think about where the, that animal where you think that animal is going to going to move where it's going to appear and you want to put your camera in that location and that, I, I don't know like it's not like art of like drawing or creating a piece, but like the art of like thinking with nature and anticipating and being, acting like you're 
that other side. I don't know. Did that that might not make sense, but yeah, I um, think there is art and experience. So like thinking about that intimacy is definitely art and experience. I also was thinking about I, I don't know if it was like uh, what do you call it when uh, those tales that you're told or or that like when you talk to your plant. Um, uh, you're actually helping it or something because you're like breathing carbon dioxide to it or, or something. So, but going back to Robin Wall Kim and breathing sweetgrass, um, where she, she, she said having a relationship with the earth and the plants and talking to them as if you like they were a person or you had a relationship with them because they are a living thing and knowing that it's a living organism uh, is just so important and powerful to have that connection in your heart and in your soul and your mind. And so um, I was just connecting that like weird tale you're told when you're a kid and then that actually talking to them is um, important to like, really feel that relationship. So, yeah. Yeah, that makes me start thinking about how like, she talks about often like a gift back to nature since mother nature is giving so much to us and like how do we say like thank you and I think art in a, in a way is that because you're saying I appreciate your beauty I appreciate all that you're giving to me so I want to create this like the gift of my own um, and then I want to share that beauty of nature with other people right so receiving the gift reflecting on the gift and then giving it away so it kind of reminds me of that um your teachings there but yeah one of my favorite, I, I heard an interview with Robin uh, once and, and, you know, since she's, uh, she is um, very involved with both the scientific community um, and with local indigenous communities. And, and so the, the question was asked, you know, I, I really like this way of thinking the medicine wheels and I want to, I want to be able to teach that to my kids. I think this was a teacher asking the question, but I don't want to really appropriate, you know, these cultures, and and so what's 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 a meaningful way of doing that? And 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 her response was really something from the the way of like if if you're if you're searching for your way to talk with the earth, to communicate with the earth, to uh, you know if it comes from these parts, not just the the brain, the copying the facts. Uh, but if it if if you're finding new ways to interpret the world, and it's it's meaningful, then that's that's the best way to do it. Um, and so, I I really love the exploration of art as a way of interpreting data. I mean, data are telling stories, and um, and so I I just love that idea of of using your whole body to experience science mm -hmm. and mind. I want to bring this up too for my mom since I think my mom's form of art is through gardening. So that too is a great way to build intimacy and of course develop that gift of nature so you can give that back to others too. So art can be anything, it can be an experience, or it can be a form. So yeah. Uh, what, <laughs> Rob, I mean, we love Robert Wall Kimmer, but in, in her book, Brings Free Grass, she talked about having a garden. And that mm -hmm. is one of the best ways of, like, if everybody in the world, like, I know everyone can, can't have a garden, but you could have a, a plant or a pot maybe in, in your in your house. Um, but just, like, being able to garden or work with the soil and, and feel it, taking it from seed to plant is just the best or a great way of connecting with nature for um, a large amount of people. And so, yeah. Mm -hmm. And Veronica, I love too that you had the the, the words, the, the the written words, with with the camera. And I know I, in, I invited some folks from the Urban Ecology Center's uh, Echo Poets group. And I don't know if anybody, uh, any of them, are here, but I really love the way that that group meets monthly, uh, exploring a theme, and uh, you know, using written word as an interpretation. Um, and and there's so many different ways to do that. I, I had some more thoughts on on Tim. You're you're on like kind of appropriating and, and maybe feeling uncomfortable if you're doing that. And and 
Robin Wall Kimmer's thoughts on like do you think is right and what you feel is right in like the, a deep sense. So like, uh, like I think of like maybe land acknowledgements and, and, and acknowledging that the land that we are on, um, there's a lot of thought out there on how you can acknowledge the land and which way you should do it. And I think that as long as you truly believe in your heart as the person giving that land acknowledgement or what, you know, whatever it is that you feel that may be appropriating, as long as you truly like believe and feel and know in your heart that you are doing good and that you really care that that's what Robin was getting at is, is super important. So. Yeah. And sometimes comes from a, a long, yeah. Yeah. And Go sometimes ahead. it takes practice too to find what that is. And it's like, I didn't start out with like the natural ability to like draw out these things or like be in touch with my emotions or just be self-aware of how I'm feeling. So it definitely takes practice to like build that relationship, to build that gratitude and that reciprocity too, even. So it just takes practice and like even forgiveness too, of not being perfect, like right away, it's like, progress, the experience, um, yeah. I'm gonna take a quick break because uh, Happy28, I'm not sure who that is, that's their username, just submitted a photo from just now of a white-tailed deer in their backyard framed by a heart. So I don't know if that's like a bird feeder, but it's a spectacular image. Um, maybe we can share it later. So. Uh, is this on iNaturalist? This is on iNaturalist and the Yardversity Project. Uh, let's see if I can share. That is a really good picture. <laughs> I want to see this now. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Okay. This will be good. Okay. I'm going to share my screen here. We're going to maybe work through this quickly. Do, do you have anything else for that? Or, or no, we're good to move other? on. Okay. Yeah. I mean, All right, I'm sharing my screen. Too, but... Yeah, absolutely. So we have, wow, we have a book memorial coming from Al. Um, oh, that's from May 3rd. Okay. I was like, uh, good to know the date. That's why it's important. Um, so we have an, uh, it says unknown here, but when you click on this picture, you'll actually see a, a, a deer is oh. in there. Um, so what you can do as a community, like I know this is a white tailed deer and it says unknown. Um, I can suggest an identification and I will type in white tailed deer and I will click on, I think enter, yeah, enter. And now uh, that should, uh, once one more person IDs it as a white tailed deer, it will then obtain what we call research grade. And that means two humans at least have verified that it is a white tailed deer. And that's super important because it just vaults it into the scientific community data network. Um, the fact that you had two humans confirm it as the same species, along with the artificial intelligence on their back end, makes it super certain that it is a white-tailed deer. And so it's a super simple answer uh, with the white-tailed deer. But once you get into some of the insects, uh, the, the, the millions of insects in the world, having two humans really makes it um, data quality. And you'll see now it has now been updated to white-tailed deer. So if you feel like you're an expert in one tax or in another, you can go to uh, the project. Uh, where am I going? Uh, university. You can go to the university project and help ID them on your own and you'll see research grade. Um, that means we had at least two humans ID it. And so for this American Robin, I can click on that observation. It is not research grade yet, but I will agree with Al and I'll click on this agree button here. And it will now make it, if you go back uh, to the main project, it will be research grade. It'll take a second to load, but um, yeah. So I just wanted to show you all that. What I love about that deer photo too, is that, uh, you know, and, and, and also that you know, just kind of combines with this Yardversity project is we're, we're really looking at it. I bet, you know, 
if you looked at almost all of the wildlife camera pictures, you know, 95% of them are out in the forest and they're great and they're and it's natural. But with this yardversity part, uh, you know, wildlife interacts a little differently in our backyards. And, you know, to bring in Veronica's work here, this is the, the way this is framed. This, uh, you know, I don't know if this is, uh, as she mentioned, I'm only looking at a snapshot of a long history of, you know, something happened before and something happened after. And somebody put up what looks like a feeder with a, with a heart in it. So anything that comes to their feeder is going to be framed in that heart. And I, so I love, I just love how this is a totally different interpretation of the hundreds of thousands of white-tailed deer photos out there. Um, this is a really, really unique one. So, so thank you uh, uh, for, sub for submitting that one. And uh, thank you for all of the, the, the you know, submissions. It's really cool. Especially with the, say oh, go ahead, Maggie. <laughs> the lighting and the reflections in that picture gives it kind of like a dreamy, misty quality too. So it is, it's really, really cool picture. That may be one of the more artistic photos in the project. That would be cool to kind of go through and kind of find the artistic side and some of the photos and create an album of that. Um, I do want to mention that if you do have a wildlife camera at home, uh, for those that do have one or are thinking about purchasing one to see what is in their backyard, as we are all interested in what animals are in their backyard, uh, you can upload those photos into the project, actually, um, and uh, they can become part of science. So um, be sure to do that if you do have a wildlife camera. Yes, and I mentioned too, you know, the 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 the, the wildlife cameras, um, and and I wasn't even making the the connection that a wildlife camera in the home in your backyard, uh, because we we usually their backyard pictures are taken, uh, you know, with just the regular process, and uh, so setting up wildlife cameras in your backyard would also provide a fairly unique additional element. And sometimes you can catch some really interesting things like this past May, I wish I had had a camera up um, because I had the weirdest activity from, I'm guessing a family of possums. There were about five or six possums active from early morning until about mid afternoon. And at one point they were aggressively fighting one another um, but it's just so bizarre because you don't, they're not, they're not active during the day, typically, especially in large numbers like that. Um, so it makes me wonder, like, could I have maybe recorded more of the buildup and then the, you know, maybe piece together a story about that to learn more about why they were up and active and doing that just for one day. It was very strange. Cornell University uh, had a series of photos from inside of a nest box with barn owls. And uh, it was only taking, it, it wasn't set for taking very frequently. So it was maybe every five seconds or 10 seconds. So you really had to piece together what happened. It's a little tragic, but it's interesting. So a snake got in there, a pretty big snake got into the box with the owls. Um, while mama was away and uh, attacked and killed one of the owls. There was maybe two or three of them um, and, and it couldn't eat it, it was too big. So the snake ended up leaving the dead owl and, and you know, you could, I think there was one shot while it was trying to eat it where one of its brothers just like put its foot on the snake, like what's going on here? Nobody, nobody's, you know, they weren't defending their brother but then mom came back and you can see like every five seconds, you, it looks like she's looking around like, oh my God, you know, one of my, one of my young are dead. And then a little gruesome, but she uh, ends up feeding the dead one to the other chicks. Um, wow. but, but that was, uh, you know, so I, I think a lot of them are taking videos now or videos are maybe becoming more popular, but it's, it's really interesting to try to like to piece this. This was maybe 15 years ago uh, that Cornell was doing a presentation. So 
-hmm. People yeah. are definitely starting to use video more to, to document the behavioral side of things as the DNR uh, talked about yesterday that some of those are kind of just like uh, whether they're they're present in that environment and at like what time of day and to some extent you get behavior because you get a snapshot they take three photos and so you can kind of see what they're doing but I'm sure uh, we will as technology improves be able to um, start being able to understand all the videos that are being collected on wildlife cameras and I'm sure there are thousands millions of videos being collected out there so yeah uh, do we all have any other thoughts on this topic on wildlife cameras or um, the emotional side of and nature and art, or shall we move into some trivia? I think we all could probably keep talking for a while, but I think That's right. that, <laughs> I think it is time for some fun trivia. All right. Well, uh, so yeah, we have uh, some questions here for the next half hour. We're just gonna have some fun uh, questions here to quiz you on your knowledge of animals, wildlife cameras, um, uh, and things of that, that, that nature. So, um, Maggie, you wanna take it off with the, the first one? Sure, yeah. Sorry, I was just looking at our, our naturalist updates. <laughs> we do have a couple more submissions in there. All right, trivia questions. Number one, a trail camera captures images at night without releasing any visible light. Rather, the flash uses what type of electromagnetic radiation to capture images? So what type of electromagnetic radiation to capture images? So type, type your answer into the chat. And uh, while we're waiting for your answers to that, uh, uh, Kayak Karen 6 has a really cool picture of a gray squirrel in a pot, not like a cooking pot, like a flower pot. Um, and uh, we also got a really nice downy woodpecker from Jen. Cute. So I love these. And we got an answer. Infrared, that is correct. Infrared technology is used in the cameras. All right, so the next one, I think we're gonna to need to share an image. And is that something you can do, Ethan, for question number two or? Uh, what would you say, Tim? Uh, we, I need to share an image um, uh, yes. for question number two. I think two you have. I th do I have that? Oh yeah, me, yes, okay, share screen. Looks uh, like Neil and Robert got that right. Nice. Uh, let me find it. Why am I not finding my PowerPoint? The question ah, will be, once you see this. All right, so I, it's, this is a little bit hard to see and maybe, it's, maybe it'll be harder to see uh, from your computer, but if you look really hard, uh, really closely at this image, uh, there is a critter that is captured. So first you need to find the, the picture of the animal. And then the question is, where will that animal that is captured in this trail cam image be spending the winter months? So first you need to find the animal and then uh, let us know where you think that animal will be spending the winter months. Um, it, is, it is kind of fun and it's really kind of a puzzle when you have images of uh, from your wildlife camera to kind of go through and find those tiny minute differences. And you may look at an image and think that's just, they captured the motion of the leaves in the background, but it's hard because every one you want to look because there could just be one slight little critter in the background or in the foreground that's really well camouflaged in or just blends in generally with its surrounding. Um, and so it is fun to kind of go through the cameras and um, determine what it is. And um, you really need a sharp eye. And we have an answer from Robert again, uh, chipmunk. Yes, it is a chipmunk, an Eastern chipmunk uh, in a hole in the ground. And the answer is yes, that uh, this is a hibernating 
uh, animal and it's, uh, it will be in the hole in the ground. In fact, it's one of the, when, when spring comes around, we have a little contest to see who sees the first, you know, example of an animal. So who sees the, who will find the first red winged blackbird in the spring um, and who will find the first morning cloak. Uh, and one of the, one of the things we look for is when the chipmunks come out of hibernation as opposed to the gray squirrels, which are out all year round and active. So nice job, Robert. Nice. All right. We have another photo for question number three here. Uh, yes. Let me get to that. So this next photo. Oh. Oh, yeah. Am I sharing it correctly? Um, oh. Nope. No. Nope. Oh, I shared the wrong screen. <laughs> That's the answer screen. <laughs> Is this Close right? your eyes, everybody. <laughs> Is this right? Yes. That's it. Yep. Okay. Um, so for this, you will also need to find the species, um, find the animal in the photo. What species of North American bird was captured in this image? from our uh, Riverside Park trail camera. So find the bird and let us know what species it is. Bonus question. Uh oh. What? Oh boy, are we, is it bad to do a bonus question? Oh, I'm just, I, uh oh, it can be good. <laughs> <laughs> what do you all think is the most common bird species that we capture on our wildlife cameras? What species of bird do you think we capture the most frequently on our wildlife cameras at the Urban Ecology Center. So we're looking for two different answers. What's, what, what do you see? What species is found in this picture? And then what is the most common? And we have an answer, at least for the first question. Soren, this is a grackle. You are correct. Sorry, Maggie, that was your, no, I stole your thunder. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is the common grackle. So it's in the lower right side of the picture. Um, you can see it's predominantly black body with a bit of that blue iridescent head. Also from Jen Grackle. And we have an oh, answer um, for the second question, most common bird from Robert is a chickadee. Um, and then Jennifer says house sparrow. Those are two great guesses, but they are not correct. It remind you that these cameras are kind of out. Uh, they're not, they're like a camera from right here. Um, and um, some maybe some more in the woods without a fence nearby. Um, should I reveal the answer or should we? <laughs> Is it a species of thrush? Yes. Hmm. Okay. We can, we can go to the next question. Oh, here we go. Al says, I think it would need to be a ground bird or do we have cameras pointing into the trees? Excellent question. It is great. Um, well, I mean, that's a, <laughs> I don't really know. <laughs> um, it is a very, very common bird um, that does spend a lot of its time on the ground, but it can, you can also find it in trees. They eat lots of worms. Um, they are, are, are an iconic North American bird, I believe. <laughs> I think we have our answer here. Um, what is that? From Jen, we have a robin. Um, that is correct, an American robin. American robin. Is, it, is a robin considered a ground bird? Uh, that's a, I don't know. I mean, it's, 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 you're putting birds into boxes, right? And yeah. It does spend a lot of time in on the ground. I would not probably consider it a ground bird since a lot of its feeding is done, yeah. you know, berries and and other things. But if you know the answer to that, let us know. Um, all right. So question next question, Ethan, if you could uh, put up the there other picture. There we go. Um, Okay, so a small percentage of people have anosmia in relation to the animal pictured in this trail cam image. What does anosmia, am I saying that right? 
What does anosmia mean? A N O S M I A. Anosmia. And anosmia. I don't know. That's a great question. And then how? Do, and the next question is how do you pronounce it? <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll I'll put the word in into the chat. And again, it's a uh, a small percentage of people have this in relation to the animal pictured in this image. And what does it mean? We have an answer from Robert and Soren. Um, inability to smell. You can't ding, smell. Ding, ding, ding. smell. Yep. And I, I think just like uh, with with colorblindness, sometimes it's 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 either a complete loss or there are certain uh, I don't know if, if smells have frequencies. Um, but uh, but I, I, I'm not sure if it's complete and sometimes it could be incomplete. This is kind of new to me. Uh, thanks, Al, for joining us and uh, for participating in trivia. Enjoy the rest of your day. And uh, we'll get to the next question. Is this another photo, Maggie, coming up? Um, yes, it is. All right. Woo! Let me make sure that it's... Did you, did you just smell that skunk, Ethan? Is that why you said oof? No, it's <laughs> oof because of a beautiful buck. <laughs> All right. A characteristic they share with other ruminants... What is unique about the digestive system of the animal captured in this trail cam image? This is a beautiful deer. That's just such a great image. Do I see another set of ears in the background or is that maybe some- Oh, of... where, behind the rock? Yeah. Right. I don't know. Here. I don't think it is, but mm. could be. I wonder. As always with birding, when you see a bag flying over a field or a black bag up in the tree, you always think it's a crow or some other <laughs> bird. And then once you look closely, you're like, oh, it's a bag. Well, I was with a couple of birders in Washington Park and we saw a black trap what, what turned out to be a black trash bag in a tree but the wind was moving it in a way that it made it look like it was eating something like the head was coming down and eating something off the branch and we stared at that thing for a good half hour before we realized it was not a bird <laughs> the bag it was just it was pretty crazy trickery in nature i had a baltimore board whoa baltimore, <laughs> baltimore. oriole leaf for about five minutes once. That was That's crazy. That was fun. Do you want to repeat the question again, yes, Maggie? Yes, I will. Um, so the characteristic they share with other ruminants, what is unique about the digestive system of the animal in this image? Another bonus question. <laughs> what is uh, unique about this specific photo and why Things are semi abnormal. What? <laughs> yeah, what? <laughs> okay, let me be clear in that question. There is something that is uh, odd about this photo. What is that? I just gotta leave it broad before I. Uh... Well, while you are, while you all are ruminating on that uh, <laughs> question. We got a couple of correct answers. Maggie? Um, so multiple stomachs, that is correct. So they have four chambered stomach, um, four stomachs, multiple stomachs also count. So nice job, Soren. Um, I don't quite know what right. the other answer is. Yeah. That makes sense. I'm gonna reveal the answer right now. <laughs> but if you look at the time of when this photo was taken, it was taken at 11 a.m. Based off of what we saw earlier, based on the distribution, the timing of deer throughout the state, we see a peak of activity at 6 a.m. and 6 p.m. generally throughout the year. So this is abnormal somewhat that we are seeing deer being active at 11 a.m. Ethan, you should write mystery novels. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> 
I stumped the whole team here. I'm, I'm very proud of that. I, I'm... <laughs> All right. Uh, can you take us to the next picture, Ethan? <clears throat> All right. So question, uh, what species of animal is pictured here? Um, I'll give you a, a, a few seconds to look at this. Um, should I read the hint right away, Maggie? You can choose whatever you see fit. <laughs> okay, I'm not sure how much of a, a hint this is. It's just cool information. So um, the hint is the cat-like face is one of the distinguishing characteristics of this species against its counterpart of a similar name. This species also exhibits more of this particular color that is also found in its name. So what is this species? Mm. Taken at 4.15 and 20 I know, now seconds. Now we have to look up the, the uh, peak activity of this animal. And <laughs> is it's also is it abnormal or not? 14 degrees. Well, I guess February. I don't even know. Do we know where this was taken from? This was in the Harbor District. Um, we were excited about this picture. Um, yeah, Harbor District uh, near First and Lincoln. Well, while we're here, I do just want to give a, a shout out to the folks at Harbor District. Uh, Robert Burnham, you are half correct in your answer. Yes, it, uh, and then happy 28. Yes, this is a gray fox, uh, very similar to a red fox. In fact, we have both of these uh, species here, um, but this is in fact a gray fat fox. And uh, Maggie, you wanna mention why it's a gray fox and not a red fox? Sure, um, so there are a variety of ways that you can tell, but um, in the, the gray fox, their tail is very long and almost as long as their body. Um, and in pictures like this, you can kind of tell because um, it looks like it's almost outlined in black. Uh, the red fox typically will have a white tip to the tail. Um, and then also in the red fox, you'll notice black legs. Uh, so they, the red fox has those black points, whereas the gray fox kind of looks more like this. And then if we did have a, a face shot of this, um, the face would look um, a lot more kind of petite um, and it, it has kind of a black mask on it too. So, yeah, go ahead. so I was just gonna say the main things in this photo are the, the legs not being black and then the, the shape and coloring of the tail. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure that gray foxes are less common than red foxes, is that correct? Mm -hmm. So oh, yeah. this makes it more exciting, especially here in Milwaukee, to have a gray fox sighting. Is that the case in general or in the cities as well? I'm just curious. I looked briefly at the data statewide between red foxes and gray foxes, and they actually don't model out the gray foxes, I think due to lack of data, hmm. which therefore I would and assume would be uh, just fewer gray foxes in general. Hmm. I could be wrong there, so don't quote me on this. Well. If anybody knows more about this, let us know. Yeah, I'm not sure if it's just in the city or outside of the city, but yeah, we were happy to see this picture. Uh, for the next question, Maggie, uh, is that another image or? Next question, it looks like, no. Okay. It is not. Tim, did you want to take this one or? Uh, sure, I can do this. Or, oh no, you just did the last one. I got it. Um, okay, next question. What is the most commonly documented species on trail cameras in Wisconsin? According to snapshot Wisconsin data, but I think that can be pretty consistent throughout the state. A hint could be that this program snapshot was created to document, observe, and analyze this specific species. And once they started doing the program, they realized they could open it up to all species. But at the initial beginning, or the initial goal of the project was to target this one species. 
I couldn't be a big hint. Too big. We have a correct yeah. answer. Two correct answers. Robert and Soren, white-tailed deer. That is correct. Correct. Very nice. All right. Next question. This one we have already talked about, and so uh, we'll uh, we'll we'll test your your short-term knowledge here. What is the term used to describe animals that are most active during dawn? and dusks was the term used to describe animals that are most active during dawn and dusk and bonus if you can spell it correctly and don't uh cheat by looking up farther up in the chat <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if we've had a gray fox sighting at one of our three branches. I don't know, Tim or Maggie. We have, we had, yeah. a, and, and Robert came in right away with crepuscular. Very nice. Uh, we got that kind of easy question out of the way. Um, but yeah, we have had gray fox and, uh, but it, it might've been quite a while ago. It might've been like 15 years ago. Um, okay. But anyway, next question. Next this question. is a photo one, correct, Maggie? A photo, yes. And it's up. Okay. Um, so I'm going to start without any hints. Um, so this is just an I spy photo. So what animal, what species do you see in this photo? Hmm. Again, the time at which it was captured could be a clue. <laughs> The time of day. It would be cool to look at time of like the day of the year and kind of like graph that out to see like, do you usually see white-tailed deer in November during the rut? Um, or um, are you seeing an increase in the springtime say? So that'd be cool to look from like, a spatial perspective from time of day and from time of year. Mm -hmm. Yay, we have one answer and it is correct. Uh, possum, Virginia opossum. Um, so if anyone's still looking, it's kind of in the, the middle of the photo. Um, and and uh, what, you know, this is, a, this is a cool, so this is as part of your adversity. <laughs> This is a nighttime photo, and um, you know I don't think I think a lot of people don't realize how po how common possums are, because they're out at night and they're secretive, and but they are uh, they are they are very common in neighborhoods, and and it's very likely that they visit your yard. And one of the good things about them is they are uh, very attractive to ticks, and so there's a lot of public health data that show that neighborhoods that have a higher concentration of possums, Virginia possums, have lowered incidence of things like Lyme disease, tick-borne disease. So uh, I think they get a pretty bad rap in the cities, but uh, they are, from, a, from an urban perspective, um, the, a really important part of your neighborhood. And Robert said, those look like eyes at the upper left. Are there two pair of possums? I don't know. It's a good, really good question. Here, that's yeah, hard to tell. Up in the towards up in the trees or on the ground? There, uh, I see there's two light, there's two like dots really close to each other up higher. Where is my, tell my cursor where to go, like right here. Uh, uh, yeah, where, do it again. Yeah, right there. I mean, the, I was thinking the two on the left. This, the closer I look, that looks like maybe not two pairs of eyes. It looks like light, I think, coming yeah. in. As a note, this location is very close to kind of an edge um, where there is, where there would be street lights and things. So that could be what's shining through in the photo. Can we invent a new something where in springtime when you're walking in the woods or a prairie, you can have like possums attached to you as you walk through. 
so you see all the ticks as you walk through a field. That would be amazing. Is that your money? Uh... <laughs> this is my new side gig. Um... Aside from his mystery novel. <laughs> uh, Robert said the second pair of eyes or with a question mark are fainter and to the right of the brighter pair. So we don't. Oh, I... right here. These two. Ah. Potentially, it could be an owl, maybe. It might take a good zoom. Yeah. And a mystery oh, novel. Man. What happened in this? Yeah, we'll take a look. But that's, yeah, that's, that brings up a fun point of trail cameras. You don't always see everything right away. Um, and sometimes you find some really camouflaged, exciting finds too. Which is why they're going to make a central feature in Ethan's mystery novel. Yeah. <laughs> So be sure as we're wrapping up in the next five minutes to finish um, submitting your observations to the iNaturalist project using uh, in the Yardversity. Make sure you always tag or select the Yardversity project so it goes specifically into this one so we can track the data. Um, uh, so please get those observations in. Let me know in chat um, or on the Facebook page or email me um, with any questions you may have about submitting uh, data. Um, so we'd love to see your observations and we've gotten some great ones today. And without sounding too much like I'm on NPR and like saying we have four minutes left and we need this much uh, donations left, we have <laughs> 1,098 observations, folks. We are two observations away from 1,100. Uh, all we need is two more. So you could have the 1,100th observation in the adversity. I think we do. Um, I'm seeing 1,103. Oh my gosh, so I did not refresh my button. Good we job. Some, we have some really nice photos of birds, which is hard to get because um, they're constantly moving. And the umbrella paper wasps, that's really interesting too. So does that mean Jen's uh, observation of the American Senate is our 1,100th observation? It could be. American Senate. Oh, cool. See, I did not know that's what that was called, but I see those all over the place. This is such a reason to celebrate. You all took us over that important milestone of 1,100 observations. And to celebrate, oh, we have a couple, or we have a question. Okay, so brighten the shadow areas. So yeah, we can bring in some exposure. This is where we need somebody that knows what they're doing. And can one submit trail cam pictures if you don't have a smartphone? Yes, you can. So your trail camera will have a SD card within it. That's where all the data is going to. You just take that SD card out. Um, you have two options. A, your computer can uh, take an SD card directly into it. Or B, you're gonna need to purchase an SD card reader and that will then connect to your uh, computer. Once it's on your computer, you'll select that uh, um, kind of within your drive, however it is. You'll then see all the images there. And then you can literally just simply drag and drop the appropriate ones into iNaturalist. I'll, I'll show you very, very quickly how to do that. Share the screen here. Um, so uh, you'll go to upload here in the top right. And we'll have uh, drag and drop some photos and sounds. So you just simply go to your uh, folder where you are holding those uh, wildlife camera photos and you just drag them and simply drop them in here. Now you may have thousands of images from that wildlife camera. I would not recommend putting them all on, but just select a few of them and put them on there. And you'll have to go through the work of making sure you're the right date, time, location for each one. Um, and there's ways you can kind of go quickly through that, um, where you can select the same location for all your photos at once. Um, but uh, that is in tutorials coming later. And as this comes to a close, I just want to say a, a heartfelt thank you to Veronica for joining us. It was really, really interesting, um, you know, learning from you and, and uh, maybe we can get you back here someday. Yeah, thanks for having me. Just a reminder, if you're participating or want to try out some art reflection, just be patient with yourself and just have fun. Doesn't need to be perfect. Mm -hmm. well, should, should we end with that last question? Let's do it. I, 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 I 
screwed it up by showing everybody briefly. So uh, I gotta, I gotta finish it off here. Um, people may not even need the full description of this. Thing. Um, who is the Disney character in this photo, described as a heroic outlaw, and depicted by a red fox who steals from the rich and gives to the poor? You know, I never realized that it was like a red fox. Mm -hmm. As opposed to a gray fox? Or yeah, just I just like, opposed to another animal. I they didn't really think of it as an animal like too much. Like mm -hmm. it's just like a name, you know, but now it's like, wow, I'm seeing an animal behind it, like with I mean So this it, this guy made it to the big screen. Past the, past the trail camera photos, this guy <laughs> 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 made it made it famous. We got an answer. Robin Hood. Ding, 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 ding. ding, ding. <laughs> nice. Good job. That was a lot of fun. Um, and again, I want to thank everybody that uh, has been participating on chat. Jen, your, your photos have been great. And and I also do want to say that um, Jen Lazuski, who's who's super smart, and involved with extension, and and one of the best entomologists we know, um, w was talking to us and and the team about uh, kind of ways to you know this is this is one part of yardversity is to get these data images in to the program, but then there's like the whole another layer of learning about it, or uh, you know as Veronica said, or you know interpreting it, or uh, and so one of the things that we're going to be looking at, and we'd love your, your thoughts on this too, is, is a way to kind of take that next step, um, whether it's talking to, uh, you know, an expert on bees like Jen about your bee photos, or, um, you know, uh, if it's a pest, maybe, maybe finding out, uh, you know, with the ecological impact on your yard. So uh, again, that's something we're exploring um, with, with uh, the folks that I mentioned. And uh, and we'd love your input as well. So we will love to see you again next month in December on December 18th. 18th. And it is a Friday next, next month. Yardversity lecture and event will both be on Friday, um, one after the other. So be sure to join us then. And in the meantime, have a fabulous rest of your weekend. Thank you so much for submitting data and, uh, we will see you all soon. Yes, thanks everyone. Have a great weekend.